Production support for Hot and Cold is brought to you by American Solar Technics, manufacturers of components for wood burning and solar heating systems. Hey, I'm Tom Gozi. This week on Hot and Cold, we're here at our project house. We've been running the pellet stove actually for a couple of weeks now, and we need an update, and we're going to test it. You test. Have you studied for the test? I have. You stay there, and you'll see how well maybe I do or that does or somebody will do well. We have, it's not pass-fail either. We'll be right back. So here we are, we've been running the pellet stove, we've been very pleased with its performance. It has done a fine job. It's been pretty much the exclusive heating source for the house here for several weeks now that we've uh, been running it. And uh, you can see it's a little, little dusty. It's ready for a cleaning. Nobody's touched it yet, so <laughs> we will clean it. But before we do that, we had some other things I wanted to do. Um, we actually have run some tests. We're gonna do them again just to see, uh, to show you what testing uh, combustion efficiency is is all about and uh, we also wanted to do something Th this machine the stove is a machine basically has got several electrical components first one is a blower you can hear it blowing and we have warm air that comes out through here we have a combustion blower which brings air into the burn pot here for the uh, to mix air with the pellets and then we have an auger that occasionally comes on and feeds in some pellets into the burn pot. So we have several, and then of course we've got electronics around the corner here. So we've got several things going on in terms of electrical things that are drawing power. And there's, oh, there's also an electric igniter. A hot, it's a hot air blower that will blow hot air on to start the fire. So what I wanted to do was take out this thing, which is called a kilowatt. This has been well used. You can see <laughs> a little melted look in there because uh, I, I was using it to the maximum of its abilities. A kilowatt is a watt hour meter that will measure the voltage of a wall outlet, which is usually 120 volts, the current that a device will draw, the wattage, which is the current times the voltage. It'll tell you the power factor which is the efficiency of the device that you're running in terms of the uh, AC being in and out of phase, which you don't want to know about, and <laughs> the, the cumulative kilowatt hours. So you could plug this in, and it will tell you how much power you use over, say, an hour or a period of time. Uh, and that's a good thing to know uh, when you have different devices running in your home. So this one in particular is running like a central heating system. It's got blowers. Blowers typically use a lot of power. Uh, so we want to see what's going on. But this device, which is about $30, you should ha I, I, I was just thinking about it. This probably should be a law that everybody has one of these uh, just to know what the power consumption is of all the stuff in your house. The TV set, the cable box, the little uh, transformer you plug in to run, to recharge your cell phone, all those things draw power. This tells you how much power they draw. So we're going to use this in a few moments. Um, this is good up to about 15 amps, which is adequate for most household things that, are, that you can plug into an outlet. Uh, it, this got a little charged because I had an electric card battery charger plugged into it, which was drawing more than 15 amps. And it still worked OK, but it wasn't real happy. So, so I learned to take that and uh, not do, do anything <laughs> I shouldn't do. Matter of fact, I noticed the plugs a little bit mutilated too here. You can see the plugs are not quite parallel. This one is it really did do a bad thing. And that's really, uh, you know, we talk a lot about circuit breakers and power and stuff. That's what happens when you overload a circuit, which I did. Uh, things get hot and melt or catch on fire.
if the circuit breaker doesn't trip. And this wouldn't have tripped the circuit breaker because it was on a 20 amp circuit. So it's uh, good to be aware of what draws a lot of juice in your home. And I tell you what, we've got these big lights. Let's just swing over here before we do this and let's look at one of our big lights and see what kind of power they draw. Okay, so we've got our big lights here. This is one of, these are I think 500 watt um, halogen lights that we use when we tape the TV show. I just swung it around so you can see how bright it is. And we're just going to unplug it for a moment. The light goes out. We'll plug in the kilowatt. We'll put the light back on so we can see what the heck it is we're doing. And now Nunzio is going to have to come way down here to uh, be able to see this adequately. You see that okay? Okay, so we got 120 volts. Let's hit the amps. We have 4.15 amps. We hit the watts. 500 watts, 499. That's what the rating is. We could do the hertz. That's the, uh, the, the frequency of the power, which should be 60 cycles. It's 59.9. The power factor should be 1 because it's a resistance device, which means nothing to you unless you're an electrical engineer. <laughs> and the kilowatt hours are, not, not, are, are nothing yet because this is uh, over, this, is, this will tabulate the amount of power that's consumed over a period of time. So if this ran for one hour, we would have 0.5 kilowatt hours of power that this device uses. So, so that's what this does. You've seen all the, the little secret things it does. So we're going to unplug the light again, go back over, and we're going to fool around with the stove now. Okay, so as you recall from uh, our last program, uh, we have the, um, the control here. We're going to put it to off. Right now it's on room temp, which is getting the room temperature off this sensor. So we turn it to off, and stuff just shut down. Now the, the unit will still run for a while, so I just wanted to turn it to off while I unplug it briefly. Plug this in, plug that in. We'll turn the unit back on again. And if you want to come back down here again, Nunzio, so you can get a good look at the... We know we got 120 volts because we just checked it. How many amps are we going to get? Is that visible? You can't see it. There it is. I, I'm... Okay. You good? Okay. 1.96, does that say? Yeah. And 108... 107 watts. That's not bad. So we're going to leave that plugged in for the show now. We can leave that right there. We don't have to mess with it. The unit is running and we will um, we'll just keep track of the time and the time is uh, uh, 10 minutes to the hour so we will keep, keep or 7 minutes to the hour. We'll keep an eye on this and we'll try to get a, a sense as to it cycling on and off and doing all kinds of stuff for the time we're taping here. Maybe we run it for a half hour or something or we'll, we'll do the math is what we're going to do. But that's, that's, so that's the first part. We want to know how much electricity we need to use to run this unit. 100 watts is not much. Light bulbs, well you see my, my big lights here are 500 watts. They're big lights, but a standard 100 watt light, this is using the same power as a standard 100 watt light bulb to run the entire heating system. When we do start up the fire, when we, the igniter comes on, that will pull a lot more current, but still well within the means of, of uh, obviously the household wiring and that only runs for a few moments while it's starting the fire. Um, okay, so I tell you what, we're going to take a quick break here. We're going to take the break. We're going to head outside because we have to do an efficiency test. An efficiency test, you say? Ah, this is what it's all about, energy efficiency. We'll be right back. Hey, we're back. And uh, I wanted to show you this. Um, uh, this is an efficiency tester for a combust combustion device and uh, this will test for uh, different kinds of appliances. If I turn it on, it runs for uh, 60 seconds. You can hear it. It's got a little uh, pump in here that draws air in through this probe and, or, or gases in through the probe and it will measure, I'm going to shut it off, uh, it will measure um, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, oxygen, temperature. So we can, and it will also do efficiency, it'll calculate the efficiency for you for different fuels. So this will test for fuel oil, for kerosene, for propane, and for natural gas. Now we have none of those fuels here, but the device is basically reading 
uh, these different gases and what we're interested in specifically is carbon dioxide and oxygen. It's nice to know the exhaust temperature. It's also nice to know what this carbon monoxide is, although it doesn't matter, it's vented outside. But that's what we're going to do now. We, so th what happens with this device is this goes into the gas stream as it comes out of the unit and we're measuring for those gases and the temperature to see what's happening. We can't do the efficiency uh, actual number but we can from experience we know what we, where we should be at and uh, we'll, so we'll do the math in our heads here when we get outside and uh, this is uh, for years people who test gas equipment have used sort of, I call them mechanical devices, they're chemical devices that um, are, uh, you, you may have seen people use them in the past, they have a regular thermometer, they have a, um, a probe that you use a little hand pump to draw gas into it for measuring carbon dioxide. Oxygen is measured, um, I'm not sure how they measured oxygen, but uh, this does it all electronically and most people in the um, combustion industry who are testing your oil and gas furnaces are using devices like this. Now this is actually a little bit older. This is, it looks like it's high tech and brand new, but it's a couple years old. Uh, but it, it works fine for my purposes being a, uh, somebody who makes believe he does this stuff on TV. So what we're going to do is plug the, the hose in here. This is a little primitive compared to some of the newer ones. This is a thermocouple. This is the temperature probe. And there's also a little nub there on the bottom where you hook the hose on and we'll plug the thermocouple back in and on the probe end of things here got it all kind of tied up here we have a water trap if there was water in the uh, gas stream uh, this would trap water through and, and also filters any debris you can see there's a little bit of a little bit of fly ash in there can you see the black speckles maybe maybe not that's fly ash that came out of the flu when I was testing it the other day and we'll talk about the test in a minute but why don't we go outside put our coats and mittens on and go outside and see what kind of uh, things we can test. So we're outside now and I've got the probe all warmed up and we're gonna put it right into the flue a ways. Um, and we have a little bit of a dilemma here in that it's so bright out today that you can't really see the display so I'm gonna have to read it off to you. And what we do is we let it in, stay in there for a little bit to stabilize and the oxygen sensing uh, the oxygen number. What we're looking for in oxygen is if there's good combustion we should have no oxygen coming out because all the oxygen has combined with the fuel to make carbon dioxide. And we've got an O2 number of 0.0, .0 which is better than we should expect so we're very happy with that. We've got a, um, a stack temperature of about 380 which is a slightly high just because the heat exchanger does need to be cleaned, you've seen that. We've got a carbon dioxide reading of 13.8, which is pretty good. Uh, for people who know something about um, uh, combustion, uh, that's about where we want to be for most combustion appliances. And uh, carbon monoxide, we're only about 60 parts per million, which is pretty decent. We, uh, it's a good indication that we're in a good place in terms of the uh, um, not having too little or too much air mixing in with anything. Uh, let's just look at the numbers one more time here. Yep, we're still around 380 for the temperature. Uh, we're around 13.8 for the uh, carbon dioxide that hasn't changed and the O2, the oxygen, is right at 0.0%. So we've got very good combustion efficiency. I'm going to take my hand out of there because that's a little warm. It's not too bad, but it's, uh, it's looking good. So, you can see here with a lot of heat has kept this clear. We have a lot of snow sliding off this metal roof. Uh, it's always a concern that when we have a, um, a flu that we do not have any uh, impingement on the, on the flue pipe. We want to be able to make sure this always can vent properly. We want to have at least 12 inches of clearance between the ground or the snow and the flue pipe. We've got that. And of course, this was a big pile of snow that the warm air coming off of this has kept melted away. So that all looks good. This looks fine. This is warm to the touch, but not so hot I can't keep my hand on it, which is good. We have the clearance to combustibles we're looking for. So all this looks fine. I'm very happy with the results. We have another Harman stove 
down in Stockton Springs that we tested, we got the same numbers out of that one. So apparently the Harman stoves are efficient and they're getting heat in where we want it to be. Those are two good things. That's what we're looking for. We want to get the most bang for the buck. And uh, Jim has been telling me for years, Jim Rocket from uh, Evergreen Home Solutions, that Harman is the best and I can see he wasn't kidding. Anyway, let's go back inside. It's too cold, but my knee is melting through the snow and now I'm all wet. Hey, we're back inside. I'm just checking the kilowatt here and we're uh, still running about 100 watts uh, per hour and for the time we've been outside, which has been about 15 minutes, we've ran about 0.3 kilo, 0 0.03 kilowatts, which is about right. So, so that all jives with everything. Um, so we're very happy with the results. Somebody had asked me about on the efficiency of the stove, well, what about when the feed rate increases, the feed rate decreases um, in, in terms of combustion efficiency, mixing air, uh, do, do things stay in sync? Well, this stove doesn't really do that that much. It will adjust feed rate to some degree, but it turns itself on and off. So uh, every time I've tested it, we always seem to come out with 0% excess air. So I'm not going to argue with that in terms of uh, efficiency testing. And it's close enough that uh, I don't see anything that scares me. I, I, I have a lot more faith in Harman's ability to engineer a good product than I am in my ability to test it properly. But it looks good. I, I've talked, I sorted this out with Dick Hill, and he and I are in agreement that we're testing it the right way. Anyway. So, so this all looks good. We're happy with the efficiency. We're happy with the heating. It's done it. This house is kind of spread out. From where I stand to the furthest point, we go around the corner through a doorway to the bathroom, which is, you remember we did the bathroom way back when. Very small room, kind of geographically isolated. That room is warm. All the upstairs stays warm. We just have this small stairs that the heat is going up from. So it's done a great job. This has been the standalone heating for the house. We have the oil for backup. This is the primary heat mode and we've got pellets and uh, we're happy because just right out of the gate we're saving 30% uh, in the cost of the fuel. We got to take a quick break. When we come back we may touch on this a little more. We got another project we're getting started though which we need to look at. So right next to our stove we have the front room of the house and you remember last time we looked at it we had ceiling tiles up here. Uh, you may have noticed when we did the show on the stove, there was no ceiling. There still is no ceiling. Um, I've left the strapping up because we can use it. Um, ceiling tiles all came down. You can see why they put ceiling tile up here. The old ceiling was a mess. Uh, it's got peeling paint. Uh, it doesn't look real pretty. And we're going to clean it up. Now, it's kind of funny. Um, there was crown molding here which we had to take off in the process of redoing it and, and you can see gaps and voids and old wallpaper and the rest. Anytime we get to do this it is kind of a nice archaeological dig. Uh, but now that we've got this, we, the strapping will stay, we want to run edge and center bead pine from side to side. And this, as you recall, is 15 feet wide. So we're going to have to infill here with some little pieces of strapping every two feet down this 15 foot length. Uh, I, I was, was going to start it today, but I decided not to. We'll do that soon, though. Um, and over on this side, um, we can continue putting the strapping perpendicular to this the way it should be when we get to doing this room. But we'll do this room first. We'll move, every, we'll move everything out, do this room, and set over. So uh, uh, again, this is about a $300 project, so it's not a big deal. It's just been a matter of getting everybody in one place at the same time to do it and that maybe will be next week. So we're prepped. We've got the ceiling tile down which weighed nothing. Um, the only thing we'll need to do is remove some of these. These were stapled up so we'll have to beat the uh, staples down when we put the uh, edge and center bead up. We don't have to pay too much attention to that detail. Um, we don't have to worry about filling any cracks here because we're covering it. This is not a ceiling, this, uh, it, well, there's a floor up above it and this is heated space so we don't have to worry about cracks. Um, and I don't know if you recall, this wall is not done yet. This is the wall we have not yet insulated. So it's kind of cool to the touch. Um, all the other walls in the house have now been insulated. But from this corner over to that corner, which is about 22 feet or so, um, there's 
whatever is there was put in the wall by way of cellulose uh, and that's it. So this wall I think we're going to wind up being outside uh, come springtime and we'll get do it like we did on the uh, driveway side. Get the uh, old sidings off, the old vinyl and the old um, wood. We've got two windows to replace on this wall and uh, we will reside. We'll put foam and then we'll reside. Um, this window is going to stay away. We covered the window over that was here. Uh, this window is still in place, but I figured as long as it, it, it was in the way for doing the TV show when we put this in, so we just covered it over and we'll do all our refinishing from the outside when we get to that point. Um, the electrical stays the same, the heat will stay the same, and uh, this is really the last room in the house that we need to do something with. One thing I noticed, I'm really, you know, I've really been pleased with the comfort in this house in terms of the radiant panel we put in for the central heat and of course now with the pellet stove it just uh, is uh, incredibly warm. The one thing that we've talked about on the radio and I really want to emphasize again, this is the living room. This is the space where you spend most of your time. The floor plan is fairly open. So that gives us a great benefit in that we have the heat where we spend most of the time. Something struck me the other day though when I was in here uh, doing the test for the first time on the uh, efficiency. I happened to be on the floor, spent a lot of time on the floor, and I noticed the floor is cool to the touch. That is because the basement, as you recall, is wet. It's somewhat drafty. Uh, hopefully it's less drafty than it was a year ago. but. I don't notice that in this room. I didn't notice it with the radiant panels. I don't notice, certainly don't notice it with this because we're very uh, evenly tempered. At some point we've got to do something to insulate the floor. At my house, um, the floor is not cold to the touch. In this house, the floor is cool to the touch. So we want to take care of that. And what we really need to think about is the, you know, we spend a lot of time insulating. Um, is it cost effective to do? When you're doing with the pellet stove, you know, maybe the, 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 um, the payback isn't that long, uh, excuse me, the payback is too long to do these energy improvements when you start using something like a pellet stove where the fuel is relatively cheap compared to oil. But oil's not always going to be cheap as it is now. Pellets aren't always going to be as inexpensive as they are now. These fuels will continue to go up in cost. The energy efficiency improvements we do to the building are a one-time deal. And even if the economics don't look phenomenal, you know, you don't have a two or three year payback, which is what, 30, if it's a three year payback, it's 33% interest return on your money. You can't beat that. Think about this. There's a comfort issue. And if we can keep the surfaces of the building insulated and warm, we're going to stay more comfortable and as we get older we all want to be comfortable and we're going to tend to feel the cold a little bit more and of course as we get older uh, the fuel costs are going to go up so we have this unfortunate happenstance of as we get older we want to stay warmer just because we're getting older uh, but we can I guarantee you if I don't guarantee anything for you and any of the stuff that I do fuel costs are going to go up and as we get older we don't necessarily want to have to cut back on our lifestyle and I don't think we need to if we can do these energy efficiency changes and we do stuff like this. Um, again any device in the room with you is going to keep you comfortable. The pellet stove I think is the best fit bang for the buck in terms of fuel cost. There is some issues we need to deal with by way of cleaning it. We occasionally have to throw pellets into the unit um, and maybe next time we'll shut the unit down and we'll do a cleaning for you so you can see what that's all about. Next couple of weeks we'll get to that. Anyway, these are the kind of things we want to make sure you understand and we can help you deal with in making a decision in terms of what you're going to do to keep warm. We got to go because we are out of time. A couple of things. You can talk to us on the radio. You see we're at the end of the show. Uh, we're on all over the state of Maine now so tell your friends and of course Look at the website, hotandcold.tv. That's also at the, in the credits at the end of the show. It has been redone, and we'll keep adding stuff to that regularly. So there will be new stuff there on a regular basis. But we are out of time. This project is doing as good or better than we hoped it would, and we will see you next week. 
Production support for Hot and Cold is brought to you by American Solar Technics, manufacturers of components for wood burning and solar heating systems.